This is Campbell's Biology Chapter 20, uh, Lecture Part 1. So we'll start with a uh, just brief discussion on genomes um, and the Human Genome Project from some 10 years ago where the entire genome of six individuals was sequenced. It was completed by 2003, that's uh, about 10 years ago, uh, giving us the letter-by-letter -letter sequence of what a normal human, whatever that means, uh, should be. Um, and a lot of the techniques that we'll talk about today uh, aided in this uh, development. And now that we have all this data, now we enter the, uh, the boom that is uh, bioinformatics and, and what we do with all this information. Um, so we're able to manipulate organisms and their genetic components um, to make products, to analyze products, to analyze how living things work. Uh, one example is a microarray, which we'll talk about later, uh, which measures gene expression. Uh, for uh, what used to be thousands and now the ability to do millions of different genes on one little glass slide. Pretty amazing stuff. Uh, there's what you would see as the uh, output of a microarray. Um, you, of course, don't know how to read it. Nobody does. A computer does it. Uh, so first off with cloning, a very simple process where you have uh, gene-sized pieces of DNA and you make multiple identical copies. Uh, this is typically done with bacteria and plasmids um, pretty easily where you take your gene of interest, you put it into a plasmid, and then you transform it into a bacterium. And we'll do this in our transformation lab, although we won't be creating the plasmid. We will have already received the plasmid. Um, and then this bacterium, when it reproduces, it makes many, many copies of your gene of interest. And let's say, for example, if your gene of interest is uh, the gene for insulin, you now have these bacteria making the gene for insulin, and when they express the protein, they're making insulin for you, and you can purify that protein out and uh, package it and sell it. And in fact, this is actually uh, how it works. Uh, if you are diabetic and you buy insulin, it's made by E. coli. Uh, in order to do this, you need restriction enzymes, which cut DNA at very specific sites. Restriction enzymes are used by uh, bacteria as defense mechanisms, it's part of their immune system, to attack invading viral DNA. Uh, it cuts the viral DNA at specific sequences called restriction sites, um, yielding or resulting in some restriction fragments or pieces. Now, mostly what we use in, uh, in biotech uh, are restriction enzymes that create sticky ends. There are some that create blunt ends, which basically means a straight, flat line. Uh, sticky ends are better. We'll show you in a second what that means, but you have a short sequence of, a, of one of the double strands of the DNA, a single strand sticking out, uh, ready to be hybridized by another end. Um, so this helps to uh, get them to attach together, and then you seal the two strands of DNA, the new one with the old, uh, the two sticky ends that you've stuck together, uh, with DNA ligase, the same one that's used in DNA replication. Uh, it, it promotes the formation of a phosphodiester bond uh, between the nucleotides. So here we see a sticky end having formed where you see this little uh, piece of uh, single-stranded DNA sticking out, and it will complementary bind to another strand here you see from the original one. But if we take this fragment of DNA and cut it with, uh, let's call it restriction enzyme X, and we take this restriction, this DNA that was also cut with restriction enzyme X, they'll have the same sticky ends that are complementary to each other, and now we can hybridize them together. Uh, the last step here, this phosphodiester bond created between this one strand uh, between the A and the G there would be done with DNA ligase. Uh, these are already complementary to one another and they bind with hydrogen bonding. So the, uh, the, the finding of these restriction enzymes was quite significant in our ability to manipulate genomes um, and enabled us to create these uh, cloning vectors, which is basically the plasmid with the new DNA that we've added inside to add to DNA to replicate. So here's an example of one where we have E. coli and we've added a plasmid here. Now, often when we do cloning um, and we grow out these cells, we want to create a plasmid with both our gene of interest. Here in this case, we have LAC-Z. LAC-Z is a gene involved in lactose breakdown. Uh, if they have the LAC-Z gene, then they can break down lactose. And we've also included a selecting agent or selecting gene here, the AMP-R gene for ampicillin resistance, so that uh, only those cells that get the AMP-R gene when we grow them on a medium with ampicillin will be able to survive. And thus we know anything that grows and lives on our ampicillin medium must have been transformed. They must include both the AMP-R gene and our gene of interest here, the LAC-Z gene. Uh, 
So we take these, we transform them into the bacterial cells. The bacterial cells uh, reproduce. They're now recombinant bacteria because they incorporate this plasmid. And when they grow out on a dish, um, you'll see the colony carrying non-recombinant plasmid with the intact laxity gene. They're blue. We won't get into the reasons why and so on. Um, but the ones of interest are the white ones here. And then by screening the white colonies with a nucleic acid probe, we can identify which ones have the gene of interest. We don't need to do that in our lab. When we do transformation, ours is a little bit simpler, but that's just one example of how you'd do it. Um, how would you use this radioactive probe? Well, there's a process called nucleic acid hybridization, which is where you take your plate with all your different colonies on it, and you put down some paper, uh, this nitrocellulose paper, and it gets some of the bacteria on the paper, like you see here, um, all these various dots. And then you pour this solution over it with a radioactive probe. Um, the radioactive probe is single-stranded DNA that is complementary to the DNA you're looking for, uh, the DNA that you've inserted through transformation using that plasmid. And then when you um, expose this paper, this film, to uh, UV light, it shows up, um, these colonies uh, show up or ex the film gets exposed because they carry um, the gene of interest or the DNA of interest because the probe bound to those colonies. Um, and then you would go back to your master plate and you would select just those colonies um, and you would grow those out. You know those colonies carry your specific gene of interest. Okay. Uh, next topic, genomic libraries and cDNA libraries. So uh, if you have an organism or cell, more specifically, and you, uh, you want to investigate or learn about its genome, you can take its genome and essentially blast it into pieces with restriction enzymes, just a bunch of different pieces, and then take all those pieces of DNA and create a genomic library, which is all those pieces get inserted into plasmids, and then you put those into bacterial clones, that you can then store off and use and select for through nucleic acid probe hybridization. Or sometimes people create phage clones with a phage library. This is a plasmid library. It's a library of all the DNA from one cell uh, stored in these bacterial cells in these plasmids. Um, and then you can also do the same in a phage library where you store the DNA inside phage uh, to create recombinant phage. Um, now, a cDNA library is more commonly used. The genomic library has so much DNA, both coding and non-coding regions, that it's not always as useful for some scientists, depending on what they're studying. cDNA or complementary DNA libraries are used far more commonly, which are reflective of the mRNA that has been created or transcribed from one cell. So this basically is all the genes, the coding regions of a cell. You take the mRNA at one instant in time that the cell has produced, and you use reverse transcriptase to convert it into DNA. Now that DNA is the DNA of all the genes in that cell, meaning only those genes that are turned on and expressed in that cell at that moment in time, such as you can compare brain cells and liver cells, um, and therefore study what uh, genes are turned on and what protein products are going to get made and so on. Um, now, there's other alternatives where instead of looking at the uh, genome specifically or the DNA itself, you can actually look for the proteins or the enzymes that are created or encoded for by those uh, sequences by looking for the activity of the enzymes or the presence of the encoded protein to begin with in those cells uh, through uh, levels of expression, maybe through a microarray, for example. Um, and then that'll tell you how much of that protein is being made uh, and thus if a certain gene is turned on or not. Now, when we do this cloning and try to create, um, to use eukaryotic DNA uh, inside bacteria and so on, we run into a few problems um, because they're uh, genetically different and structurally the way they express um, genes is different. Remember, um, bacteria or prokaryotes often uh, or set up things, these genes in operons where one is stacked next to the other with an operator and promoter and all that. Whereas in eukaryotes, you have one gene with one promoter, and they're separated. Um, so there's differences, which is a problem. So to overcome this, it's fairly typical for scientists to use a very highly active uh, prokaryotic promoter, um, 
that's taken, uh, often only exons of interest came from a cDNA library, which you attach to this overly active prokaryotic promoter um, to hopefully get that promoter to, uh, to bind to transcription factors and so on, to turn on, basically, to express your gene of interest. Um, now, the other means, which is probably less commonly done, but still done all the time, is to use yaks, yeast artificial chromosomes. Yeast are eukaryotic cells, so you don't have a lot of these uh, gene expression problems like you did with prokaryotic cells. Um, because of the eukaryotic origin of DNA, they also have a centromere and they have telomeres on the ends, um, that they're far more um, uh, user-friendly in that way to, um, to work with eukaryotic DNA. They also happen to be have larger genomes. Prokaryotes have very small genomes, so if you're using a large amount of eukaryotic DNA, you're, you just may simply run out of room in a prokaryotic cell, whereas in a yak, you, uh, you can incorporate much longer DNA strands, uh, even an entire gene, for example. Uh, and we'll take a pause on this one.